and Marvin necessarily wanted to be announced, but he mentioned the shooting. He had a third cousin that actually was in that uh, church building that got killed. And so it's, just, it's amazing how small the world is. And so uh, his prayers are appropriate. Okay. So we finished the book of Nehemiah. And um, we're not going to review it all because you have it down pat so well. Uh, <laughs> if I quiz you, you would answer every question correctly. 52. What's that the answer to? How many days it took to rebuild the wall? And so uh, here was this man that cried over the condition of Jerusalem, but he set out to do something about it. And central to his restoration of uh, rebuilding the walls, and not just the walls, but all their worship and everything, was he read the word and he prayed. And then he took action. But he prayed and took action, prayed and took action. But it was all based upon reading the word, too. He realized Here's what the Lord said, and we're not doing. And they prayed about it, and they repented, and then they uh, restored what God asked them to do originally. Now, there's a modern-day application that today, and we'll try to set that up in today's class and then look at the solutions and how we can rebuild. But we have to look at some history because we're going to see that everything in the Old Testament is a spiritual picture of our spiritual reality. We've said that many, many times. That God is painting a picture using nations and and people and cultures to illustrate what he's going to do for us in Christ. And so the parallels are uncanny. They're not coincidental. They're just amazing. Just like they crossed the, uh, they were in Egyptian uh, captivity. We're in slavery to sin. It took the death of the firstborn to uh, escape out of Egyptian captivity. Took the death of God's firstborn. That's the Passover, and it's our Passover. They crossed the Red Sea, and there was water on both sides and water above. 1 Corinthians says they were baptized into Moses. That's how they were they left their sin and captivity behind. And the other shore they had, freedom. Well, we're baptized into Christ. We leave sin behind, and we have freedom. And so then they conquered, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And our life is like 40 years on this earth, wandering in the wilderness. Doesn't it feel like that way sometimes? You're wandering, sometimes you just want to get out here and go home, okay? Well, they crossed the Jordan River and that took them home. And they went to a place that was already built for them. The orchards were already there. The houses were already prepared. And do we have a city prepared for us? Who went before us to prepare a dwelling place for us? Jesus. And so it, it's just amazing the, the parallel. Now, while they're in Israel, uh, we see their struggles as a nation. That they did well, and then they went into captivity because they fell away from the Lord. They repented, and they came back. And uh, when they prospered again, they fell away. And when they fell away, God brought up enemies. And they repented and cried out, and God brought it another deliverer. How often did that cycle repeat itself in the book of Judges? 13 times, right? And uh, then they said, We want a king. So you could say, not that literally it happened, the throne of God left heaven and went, ended up on the earth. They wanted a man to sit on it, didn't they? That created all sorts of problems, didn't it? And uh, yet, uh, uh, it ended up dividing the kingdom. Half the kingdom went into Syrian captivity, never to be seen again. Judah went into Babylonian captivity because of their sins, but they were restored as a remnant. That's where Nehemiah comes back and builds the wall. Well, the same thing happens with us, that we're under a new covenant. We're part of Christ's kingdom. But while we're on the earth, do we have similar troubles and trials like they did as a nation of Israel? And for we're going to see throughout the history of the church that there was a falling away and people have apostatized from God just like Israel did. They were unfaithful to God. And the church in many ways, you know, it was hard to find, and but it was always there. And we see the, the process of the Reformation and the Restoration where people went back to God and there were giants of a man that restored people back to uh, the, the truth of God's word. But that battle continues today. And we're always in the, the process of building 
or furthering God's kingdom and always fighting, you know, apostasy. And so we want to talk about some of those principles and see what we're currently facing today. But that's going to be a couple lessons down the road. We got to set the stage first. All right. So what we want to do is look at uh, today just the um, the promise that uh, Christ Church would endure forever. And I call it the perpetuity of Christ Church. And what do I mean by that title? Gary? It'll last forever. All right? Now, where do we get that? Because we know that uh, when Jesus was on, on, on Mount Hermon at the base of it, that uh, he takes his disciples in Matthew chapter 16... And he asks them, who do people say that I am? And he gets all that various answers. But then he makes the question very personal. says, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of a man, because you just called me the son of God. And flesh and blood didn't reveal this, but my father. And upon this rock, and what was the rock? The fact that Jesus is the Christ, the son, on himself, upon myself, basically. I'm going to build my church. And what does the next phrase say? The gates of Hades will not prevail, or my, the New Marrying Standard says overpower. Now, what can we infer by that statement? It will never fall. Not forever. It's forever. What? Not even death. So does that mean Satan will not attempt to prevail against the church? No. Oh, you know he will. It's quite the opposite. Because throughout the course of history, every time God does something, of course, it's always done very well. The Garden of Eden was paradise. Who comes along to try to destroy it? It's Satan. You know, and we reviewed this and talked about it, but you have to expect it. That any time God does something, Satan's there to counter it and try to destroy it. Uh, you shall not die, is what he told uh, Eve in the garden. When God said, don't eat of the fruit, because you shall surely die. So now she has to choose. Do I listen to God or a snake in the grass? Well, people like to listen to the snakes in the grass because they'll tell them what they want to hear. And so that's our challenge, okay? That was the challenge of Israel. They listen to the living God or listen to the, the gods of the wives they've married that they shouldn't have married in the first place, the false gods, right? Um, and the challenge is still today. People we're going to see have itching ears and they don't want to follow God. And so we're going to see that, that Satan's going to try, but this is so assuring. He will never prevail. He will never overpower. So... The implication is, could you expect, because of this statement, that any, time, any generation in history since the initiation of the church, you should expect to find it somewhere on the earth? Does that make sense? So if we were to draw a timeline, so I thank Bruce for bringing this up. Um, we know that God had a plan before the beginning of the world to create the uh, heavens, I mean, excuse me, uh, to create the church. And this mystery was revealed to nobody. Nobody understood what God was doing. When I say nobody, who does nobody include? Even the angels had no clue. They were stooping over from heaven trying to figure out what God's doing. All right? Did the prophets understand when they prophesied of it? No, it was, in, it was a secret in the mind of God and now it's been revealed to us. That's right. Through the gospel in Christ, we find out here's God's plan to save man and put us back in a relationship. And when you're in Christ, you're in his church. Now we know that. And all God's plans, his mysteries are revealed. And in all things, it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10 and 11, all things are summed up in Christ. That's an amazing statement. If you want to make sense of anything, the answer is always what? Jesus. Jesus. Any question you ask why, what's the answer already? Jesus. Jesus. Now, you might not know how to connect the dots to get to, from your question to Jesus as the answer, but what's always the answer? 
Jesus, all right? You think that's funny, Gary? <laughs> Why? Because I never wanted to show my work in that. <laughs> you don't have to show your work. <laughs> Just, well, we're, this is not a math class. He's a math teacher, right? The answer is always Jesus. I know in math you got to know should get from there to there. But here it's always Jesus. You know that. He's answered everything. And your life's only going to be made complete in Jesus. And so it's all about being in Christ. That's where we're going to be made perfect. That's where we're going to go to heaven. That's where we have a relationship with heaven. Who do you think is going to attack that then? That's right. So Ephesians chapter 6. I always want you to remember this. So we're but our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're fighting against the spiritual realm, Satan. It's not against men. Does he use and employ men to do his bidding? But don't fight them. We're fighting Satan. All right. So, with that being said, that's the first century that... Now, can we condense it into a smaller timeline? Can we? Yeah, you can do that. All right, thank you. <laughs> I have to ask for your permission. So now, we're going to make our timeline, and here's now 2017, and uh, here is the cross, and here's the church. So we've condensed it, right? Here's the mystery, but here's the cross, and here's the church, and Jesus said it would what? It's going to prevail and you know forever, right? It's going to be under attack for all this, but it, it says the power or the gates of Hades will not prevail. So you can have confidence that the faith will continue or the truth will always be there. Or any time through history, you're going to find the church of Jesus Christ somewhere on the earth. That's what we're understanding from this verse. But it's always going to be under attack. Always. And we're going to read uh, the, the, the promise of that. We're going to look, spend some time first on that, showing the assurance. Then we're going to show the nature of this kingdom, how it's different than the kingdom that was found back here. All right? You've got to see the difference. And why, why this one did not endure, and why then we'll understand why this one will prevail and last forever. You'll see it by understanding the fundamental difference between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we're going to look at the promise of the falling away, the apostasy, all right? And that, so we're going to draw another line down here, and we're going to call that the apostasy or the falling away. And that's religious apostasy, right? And this is going to dominate the history for many, many, many generations. Even though it dominates the scene politically and uh, religiously, what do you, have an, do you have an assurance of? The church is still there. It still prevails. And sometimes it's hard to find. Can we say that today? It's hard to find the Lord's church? Yeah, because Satan is trying to hide it. He's hiding in all these counterfeit faiths, and we'll talk about that down the road. But even in the Lord's church today, it's, the church is constantly under attack by Satan. So there's our text. So we're going to look at it. His church will endure forever. We're going to look at the kingdom of the new covenant, the predicted falling away. Then I, wanna, I think it's exciting. This is the history part. I'm going to show you evidence the church has existed through all this whole period. All right? And it's been there. In its pure form. And that's kind of exciting. Yes? Yes. And it hasn't, hasn't stopped. It's not a new thing. I mean, God said to Cain after he did, you know, I didn't have a good sacrifice. If you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. That's right. That's right. And perhaps the more closer you are to God and faithful to him, the more attacked you will be. And those people that are part of the falling away, maybe perhaps Satan will cuddle them or cause right? Because he wants them to feel comfortable 
where they are so they won't have reason to look at their own faith. So I'm going to try to give you a handout because there's going to be lots of material. So here's the first four pages. If you didn't get them, they're on the back stand, and we'll add to it later. All right, any questions what we're doing? We might have a quiz, too, all right? So <laughs> that's for um, Donna's sake. All right. She likes quizzes. Okay, let's look at the promise uh, uh, of the Christ church being continuing. And we're going to go through these quickly. First of all, Daniel chapter 2. We studied Daniel last year where they're in Babylon captivity And Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of this large statue, right? Does anyone remember what the head of gold was? That's Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of Babylon. And then the chest of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, that was going to conquer the Babylonians. And then the chest of of bronze and brass. Greece, strong. And that's going to be Alexander the Great that's going to come in there and just take over the but they're going to be conquered by the legs of iron, feet mixed with clay. Rome, all right? Iron, not as beautiful as gold or silver or brass, but strong. And the Roman Empire is going to absorb all those other kingdoms and rule. Then he says, in the days of those kings, those last Roman Empire, here's what God's going to do. He's going to set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Now, God wanted to say he was going to make a kingdom which would never be destroyed. Could he made it any clearer? Right? That's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, because of this, a lot of people in the denominational world want to make this future tense even to us. All right? Even though he's talking about the days of the Roman Empire and the days of those kings, that happened way back here. God's going to set up a kingdom right there. So some people, understanding that's what it says, they want to say, since it's future, they're so con- you know, uh, uh, bound to that, they're going to even teach there's going to be a resurrection of the Roman Empire. You know, because you, you know how silly it's going to get. But no, the first and obvious uh, is usually correct, and that's what it is here. It was in these days, God's going to set up a kingdom, and we're going to show it's the church, and it's going to endure for ever. It'll never be destroyed. The land of Jesus Himself. So we'll look at it in a second. Uh, Daniel chapter seven. Uh, to Jesus, when He ascended into heaven, to Him was given dominion and a kingdom. It's an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's Daniel chapter seven and verse fourteen. Okay. Now, we're not going to go out and teach all those classes, but I just want to remind you of them. Then in Isaiah chapter 54, love this. When God sets out to do something, and this was his plan from eternity, the church. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every time that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. Do you think that's true when God... The sovereign God plans out to do something. Is anyone going to stop him? And if people try to uh, destroy what he's done, will they ever prosper? No. No. Can you have this confidence that when Jesus said his church will endure forever, that that's the case? Now, that includes you and me because the church is not just an institution. The church is what? You and I. As long as we stay in Christ, we will last endure forever. Ever. That's the confidence we have. Yes. Yeah. That's good. We said we got to be careful. If this is of God, you don't want to find yourself fighting of God. And if it's of man, they said it'd fall on its own. Right. So he understood this idea. Now, also, back in the Old Testament, God war with an oath to David, that's in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, excuse me, that he would sit, sit someone on his throne, throne who would endure forever, reign forever. And that's repeated here in Psalms 89. Once I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His 
descendants shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever. Now, that's why, again, well, I won't even start there. But Matthew chapter 1 opens up with what? Genealogy of Jesus. And it starts from the very beginning. And right in the middle, who do you see there? David, King David of the tribe of Judah. And you follow his royal lineage, and that leads to Jesus. He was a direct descendant of David himself sitting on David's throne. On the earth? No, but in heaven, because the throne's going to be restored to its rightful place. It was in heaven. They wanted an earthly king. You're going to end up back with a godly king, Jesus himself. All right? So, just showing these passages. So, when Jesus said it, we have to understand it's the case. When uh, Jesus, uh, the whole uh, angel appeared to Mary, talking about the baby that she's going to get birth to. And she said she treasured these things in her heart. I can understand why. If someone comes to you and said, you're going to have a son, he will be great. He'll be called the son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. And you go, that's my baby. She treasures these things in her heart. I can see why. You're going to give birth to the Christ child, the Son of God. What an amazing thing. But the emphasis is he will sit on the throne of David just uh, as a fulfillment of that prophecy. So Hebrews, I love this passage here where it says uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to turn there if you would as we finish this first section. Unlike the Old Testament, when they gathered around Mount Sinai, that quake, you know, and shook when God spoke the Ten Commandments. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 12, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that may be touched, to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trump and the sounds of words which sound, which no, those who heard beg that no further words. 19. We're going to take a peek at that next. That's when God made a covenant with Israel. They beg, God, don't speak anymore because if you do, we're going to die. Come to. Verse 20, for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touched the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But what have we come to? Verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. And here it is, verse 23. And to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Who is that speaking of? You and me. The church of Christ. That he said, I will build upon myself. That it will endure forever. It's the firstborn is Jesus, right? Who are enrolled in heaven. Now, Earthly Israel had their role kept where? On earth. God keeps a list of those that are in his kingdom, his church, but that list is in heaven. You've come to the church of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. I would think that is all the saints of the Old Testament that God was waiting to save through the blood of Christ. Because they were still sinners, right? Promised forgiveness, but didn't secure forgiveness until Jesus died on the cross. They're all now. That's part of this heavenly group, okay? Now, verse uh, 24, and you've come to Jesus. See, when we come to the church, we're coming to Jesus. That's how we come to the church, by coming to Jesus first of all. The mediator of a new covenant. And that's going to be our segue into the next point. And the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So verse 28. Therefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Period. So let's show gratitude by which we offer to God an acceptable reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. 
Let us show gratitude. Uh, cannot be shaken. Will Christ's church remain? No doubt. Will Satan try to shake it? Yes. But it will endure. Find, have confidence. Yes. Right. That's right. Yeah. It is the fulfillment of his eternal plan. That's right. So to minimize the church is to, oh, it's blasphemous, is really what it is. The church is the manifold wisdom of God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. It's the expression of his manifold wisdom. Yeah, oh, okay. Someone will be alive. Yeah. That's a good verse. Yeah. yeah. All right. So why did I set all this up? Because when we're looking at the falling away, you're going to have a hard time finding the church. It's going to be difficult to find it. By all admission. Just sort of like when Israel was in captivity for 70 years, if you went through Judea, you know, Israel, did you find... A glorious kingdom? No. Where are all the Jews? The majority of them. They're in captivity. Right? And all you're finding there left in Jerusalem are the lame and the old and the blind. It's like, wow, where's God's people? Well, he's punishing them down there in captivity. He'll bring them back. And we're going to find in Revelation, we're not going to look at it right now, that uh, Satan that after he wrestled with Jesus in the Hadean realm, and he was cast down, he could not accuse the brethren anymore, it says in Revelation chapter 12, it says, Now the kingdom, the authority, the power, and the salvation of our Lord has come. Because the accuser has been cast down. But it says there, after when the kingdom was established, and that was upon the resurrection of Christ and all that, that it says now he went after the children of this woman. That, in other words, and he's going after the Christians individually. And he's pursuing them. He's going to try to annihilate them. So we're going to see right after the church is established, there's a great persecution that uh, uh, rose against the church. There it's going to say in Revelation 12, we'll look at it later, that the church, God took them into the wilderness to preserve them. Well, that's interesting. Sometimes we hide in the wilderness just to stay alive. And that when you're in the wilderness, is it hard to find them? And that's going to be the case down in here. It's going to be hard to find them, but we will see them. And then we're going to look today, finally, at our modern example. Where's the Lord's church today? And what can we do to rebuild the walls so we can make sure we're safe? The church will endure. But we just want to make sure we are continue to be part of it. And we don't get seduced by Satan ourselves individually. All right? And you might say, well, how can the church endure forever and you be worried about building walls? Well, we want to answer that now. Because we got to see the fundamental difference between the old kingdom of it, with Israel and God's kingdom with us. All right? So look with me in uh, Exodus chapter 19. So out of, when Israel got out of it captivity, where did they go to initially? Mount Sinai. And they went there to hear uh, the Ten Commandments given to them, plus all the other commandments that are expressed. But this is all done so God could take this huge group of people in the millions and make them his nation. Because up until this time, I'm going to suggest to you, they are not his holy people. But he promised Abraham, I'm going to make out of you a great nation. But now he's going to adopt them as his own. He's going to marry them. Enter into a covenant relationship. So covenant means testament. This is the old covenant. That's why it's called the Old Testament. It's God's covenant with Israel. The new 
Testament describes God's new covenant with Christians. So let's see the distinction between the two. But in chapter 19, we'll start in verse uh, 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if, this is a conditional covenant, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. See that? A covenant's an agreement between two or more parties. This is an co- agreement between God and Israel collectively. Not individually, but collectively. Then you will be my own possession for all the, among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. Here it is, verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nations. These are the words you speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came, called all the elders, and set before them all the words which the Lord commanded them. In verse 8, this is the first of three times where they say, yep, we're in. What did they say? All, verse 8, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. It's like two people getting married, and the minister says, you promise before God and these witnesses to take this man as your lawfully wedded husband, to be faithful unto him until you die. You're forsaking all others. And what does the bride say? I might. (laughs) No, I do. And when they both do it, they've entered into the covenant of marriage. That's what's happening. So chapter 20, God starts speaking to them. The Ten Commandments. No other gods. No graven images. You don't take my name in vain. You keep Sabbath day to worship me. And then some laws about uh, conduct between one another. Don't murder. No adultery. Don't covet. Don't lie. And when they're done with just ten, what do the people do? They say, we can't take anymore. You talk to him, Moses, because we can't listen because we'll die. It's such an awesome thing to hear God. So he goes back up on the mountain, and in chapters 21, chapter 22, chapter 23, God continues to give them the terms of the covenant. So if a preacher married two people together and took three chapters to read the, their marriage vows, I think we ought to start doing that. And make it a little more specific so people understand how serious marriage is. And I mean that, not just jokingly. I meant somewhat jokingly, okay? Finally, in chapter 24, he comes back and look what he does. Verse 3. Chapter 24, verse 3. Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of Jehovah. All the ordinances, and the people answered with one voice. Here's the second time they say, and I do. All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. So now, verse 4, wrote, Moses wrote down the words of the Lord. And they built an altar. In verse 5, they have a burnt offering. Verse 6, he takes half the blood and he sprinkled it on the altar. And, and then he took the book of the covenant. What is that book? It's all those commandments that he wrote down in verse 4 that he heard up on the mountains in chapter 20, 21, 22, and 23. He wrote them all down. Just 10? No, all of them. And it's called now the book of the covenant. He takes it and he reads it again. The hearing of the people, verse 7. And they said for the third and final time, All the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And he took the blood and sprinkled it now on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant. The Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So now they're married. They're his holy nation. Did they keep that covenant? They had lots of problems. It was conditional. But it was a... Prom, it was a relationship very personal. God's going to dwell among them. So let's notice some things about it as we read it. It's called the Old Covenant because now we have a new. But to them, it wasn't the Old Covenant. It was the only covenant. It was just the covenant. All right? Um, it was written on stone because the ten represent the whole. They're called the tablets of the covenant. They were put in the Ark of the Covenant. It's all about the covenant. And where did the Ark of the Covenant sit? In the most holy place with the, the uh, mercy seat where God dwelt. He met them at the covenant. That's 
what it's all about. And what do the high priests do once a year? Sprinkle blood on the ark of the, or the tip mercy seat that sat on top of the ark of the covenant. Right? It's about the covenant. That's what made them his special people. Written on stone. Was it a physical kingdom? It's very interesting because not only was it a physical kingdom, it was a civil kingdom, had civil laws, but it was also a spiritual people all wrapped up into one. And it had physical borders, did it not? You, you know, he, I even outlined to uh, Abraham the territories predefined before they even got there. So it's a kingdom in every classic sense of the word. It has people, it has land, it has laws. They were physically born into it. This is very important, and we'll have enough time to talk about the new covenant. How did you become part of the kingdom of God? Without the exception of proselyting, how did you become a kingdom, a part of his kingdom? All you had to do is be born. But not just born, born of what? Jewish or parents that are direct descendants from Abraham. So if you have parents who have the DNA, the genetics of Abraham, which son of Abraham? Well, they all came through Isaac, didn't they? Right? Then they all came through Jacob, whose names changed to Israel, but then Jacob had what? Twelve plus two more, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so you could come through any of those, right? So you might be in the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Manasseh, or Ephraim, or Benjamin, or Naphtali, right? But they're all makes you part of Abraham's offspring. You're a direct... So to be part of the kingdom of Israel, you had to be born of Israeli parents. Did your heart have to be into it? Did you have to hear the reading of the law and say, I do, you know, all three, four chapters? No, you become part of the kingdom just by being born. What a privilege. But here's a disconnect, isn't there? You're physically part, but where's your heart? That's what God wanted all along with them. He said, I want you to love me with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's in the Old Testament. I want you to love me because I've done such wonderful things for you. That's why you keep your, my command. But they lost that, didn't they? They thought we're special because we're Jews. No, you're special because God spoke the covenant to you and bound himself to you, and you bound yourself to him. And if you don't obey his words, he will discard you. Because the old covenant had a collective blessing and a curse. You can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29, and 30. Blessings if you keep the covenant, but curses if you disobey. The final curse would be, God said, that's it. I'm going to divorce you, and I'll put an end to you. You will no longer be my people. Now, that's what happened to Israel. Now, the important word I put here is collective. Because did God bring these blessings upon all of Israel as a collective nation? And did the curse come upon all of them as a collective nation? Think about that one man that hid the silver in his, his tent. What was his name? Achan, the sin of Achan. Who suffered because of his sin? All of Israel. They got defeated terribly in the next battle. So they were dealt with as a collective nation and not individually with some exceptions. Now, let's look at the New Covenant. And Jeremiah chapter 31. Let's look there because we have just enough time. Jeremiah 31. Because they're in captivity. Jeremiah's promise is going to happen. But he says, don't worry. God's going to bring about a new covenant. Now, can you have two marriages at the same time? Say no. All right. So if he's going to have to have a new covenant, what's got to happen to the old one? It's got to go away. They're no longer my people. Does that make sense? Because of their spiritual adultery, God's going to divorce them, and he's going to have a new covenant. So, verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares Jehovah. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the hand of Egypt. A covenant which they broke, even though I was a husband to them. What, what covenant is that? The one we just read about, right? The old law. But this covenant, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Jehovah, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again, and man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Jehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I'll remember no more. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Because this is this God extending himself personally to those who want to have that personal relationship. So let's notice some comments about it, Jeremiah. It's a new covenant. It's new in many ways because it's not written on stone. Where is it written? In the Old Testament, when you're born in Israel, they're teaching the kids, know the Lord. You've got to get to know him. So I'm a Jew. That's good enough. No. It's not good enough. You've got to know the Lord. In the new covenant, you won't teach that. Why? Because you only come to God by virtue of knowing him in the first place. Because you're not born into it physically. But it's a spiritual kingdom where the old one was physical. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this earth. Uh, John chapter um, um, 18 in verse, uh, I'm drawing a blank, 36. It's in your notes. Uh, he said, if it was of this earth, my servants would be fighting. In Luke chapter 17, he says, the kingdom is where? Within you. It's spiritual. All right? God is spirit. You must worship him with the spirit of truth, in spirit and truth. And also, he rules not on a throne, not in a capital, but where does Jesus rule? In your hearts. You've willfully decided to give over the lordship of your life to Jesus Christ. I'm no longer in charge. He's in charge of my life. And then, it's not just for Jews and the descendants of Abraham. Who can get into it? All nations. But you have to be born into it, just like the other one. But you've got to be born again. They're born the first time into the Jewish nation. You've got to be born again to get into Christ's kingdom. That's John chapter 3. Let's look at it. Because Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. Says, we know you're of God. And Jesus just gets right to the point. John chapter 3. In verse uh, 3. Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this Nicodemus was born into the kingdom of Israel, right? He had the DNA of Abraham. Jesus said, that's not going to cut it. If you want to get into the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. So he goes, how can I do that? Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? He says, you don't get it. Verse 5, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's a spiritual rebirth. The water is the clue. Where does that all take place? Baptism. Baptism. That's where we're born again, regenerated. But that's a willful decision. If you were a Jew and born in the Jewish empire, you had no choice. You're a Jew because your parents were Jew. Did you have any choice? This is only comprised of the willing, the people that want to be with part of God. And that's very important. That's what's going to make it endure forever because these people want to be there, and that's why they'll stay there. Because it's written on their hearts. They're not coerced. And Jesus rules in their heart. And there's not a collective blessing and curse. Because when Israel sinned, who went down? All of Israel. When someone in the church sins, who goes down? The church will endure forever. The individual will be judged. Does that make sense? That's why it'll endure forever, because it's an individually you're part of it, not collectively. You come to him individually. You're not part of Christ's church because your parents were Christians. You're not part of Christ's church because your husband or your wife's a Christian. 
You become part of Christ's church because you choose to submit to his covenant. All the Lord has said, I will do. And the worst thing to do is say, I will become a child of God and then not obey him. You're an unfaithful spouse. You're cheating on our God. That's what's happening. But those that are truly Christians, it'll do forever. They'll always be there. Always be there. Now, there's the difference. And next we're going to see... Um, uh, we'll stop right there. Next we're going to see uh, how this church has endured through the apostasy. All right? I think you'll find it exciting. Come back next week. We went long, but...